Let's open our service and turn in your hymnal to page 731 and we'll sing three verses of honoring Christian soldiers. this morning um, re be remembering those people on our prayer list there have been additions and, and there's some joys in there some of those people have found found healing or, or uh, God has answered their prayers there so please be with them also uh, we have no anniversaries this coming week but we do have some birthdays on tomorrow the 7th Greg White on the 8th the election day Robin Spice on the 9th is Evan Rainbow. On the 11th is Andy Call. And on the 12th is William, William Lowther. So remember those people on their special days also. Coming up this week on Monday, deacons, you're meeting at 6.30, Board of Christian Ed at 7. So remember those meetings. Tuesday, there will be an election in the fellowship hall. This is an important election. So please make sure that you vote if you haven't already and be a part of that process. Wednesday morning at 9.30 is Lady Prayer, 3.45 Circle J and 6 o'clock choir practice. And Friday from 12 to 1 is Ladies Luncheon. Again, we are all constantly, if you can uh, fill a need for nursery and children's worshipers, leaders, we uh, would like to ask you to sign up on the bulletin board outside the office. Next Sunday, the 13th, is uh, Covered Dish Dinner. That's still... There was... Okay, next Sunday, the 13th, there is some uh, covered dish dinner. There was some talk earlier that it might not happen, but I guess it's going to happen. So um, be, bring, your, bring your, uh, your dish and whatever you'd like to share. 
and we'll have good fellowship then. Then on November the 20th, uh, we'll have a church decorating get together at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll get the, get the church building all trimmed up for Christmas and, and the Christmas season that's coming upon us. Also on the 20th, uh, Operation Children Child boxes are due back by 1 o'clock. If you don't have one yet, they're available in the hallway and uh, all the information and everything is there so you can pick one up if you'd like to participate in that. Also, um, one last thing, we're doing, normally we have done poinsettias for Christmas time where everybody's bought one. This year is going to be a little different. The church will be buying seven poinsettias. And if you would like uh, a loved one's name listed as these being in remembrance of, we'll list those in the bulletin. So you don't have to buy anything, they'll just be here. Then after the season is done, with, when we're done with them uh, during our worship service, we're going to take those poinsettias to our shepherds. We thought they would enjoy those. So are there any other announcements that need to be made? In our Sunday school classes, they're um, working on a memory verse, which is Psalms 136.1. And I thought we could just learn that right along with them. It's an easy one. It's appropriate for the season. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Um, this morning we'll be observing a, a tribute and honor of our veterans who have served to defend our country. Uh, but one thing before we get to that, today is International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. This is a worldwide event. Uh, we pray for them, people who have been persecuted, put to death, put through trauma and everything in Christ's name all over the world. We do that every day, but this is a day when we all come together worldwide as a body to uh, pray for those people. And there are many of them. We live in a country where we're not dictated that we have to be religious, but we're allowed to, to um, worship in the way that we feel God is telling us to. But that's not the case in every country. In a lot of countries, they are persecuted even to the point of death. So let's go and pray for those people at this point. Our God in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for those people who have the courage to stand up for you. Stand up for your name. Stand up for your love. We ask that you be with those people. Comfort them. Comfort their families. And encourage us to do the same. That we might stand up and we might profess your name throughout the land. We thank you for giving us these blessings. We thank you for letting us a lot a live in a land where we are free to worship as we feel you are instructing us to. We thank you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's stand together and we'll sing the Star Spangled Banner. The words will be on the screen or you'll find it in the hymnal on page 82. We'll follow that with the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag and to the Christian flag.
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior who is the King of the Saints, our brotherhood, uniting all Christians in service and in love. Uh, and now you, uh, we'll have special music from Jeff Mail. Please be seated. I can imagine a soldier on the battlefield and um, in a foreign land and one of the things that are, I can imagine driving him forward is the thought of going home and God bless those people men and women who have served uh, in our, our country in the military but this song kind of comes from that point of view expresses that but I also hear in it that we believers in Christ are also on the battle lines in a land where we don't belong, and that our desire and one of the things that motivates us is going home. Standing on the battle line, don't know if I'll live or die. Fighting to go home. All this warfare, great and small, someday will be worth it all. I'm a soldier fighting to go home. Soon I'll lay this weapon down and I'll leave this battleground and march right down the main street back. With a night so long and hard, I'm a soldier fighting to go home. I've walked through valleys dark and steep, weary days with little sleep. I'm a soldier fighting to go home. Soon I'll lay this weapon down. Right down the main street back at home Where a celebration waits I can see each happy face But there's more work to do And this war isn't done I'm a soldier Fighting to go There's been sickness, there's been pain, but a soldier never does complain when he's a soldier just fighting to go home. This old world tries its best, I will never stop to rest, cause I'm a soldier fighting to go home.
I'm a soldier Fighting to go This morning's scripture is John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Romans 13, 7. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. If you turn in your hymnals, we'll sing Battle Hymn of the Republic. You'll find it in your hymnal on page 804, or the words will be on the screen.
of your servicemen. Uh, we're going to have that presentation. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Most, I think all of the pictures that were given to us, and there's quite a bunch of them, were not given by the servicemen themselves. And that's kind of typical of, of the, the attitude that goes into service. Uh, these are people who 
volunteered or were drafted. They did their job. They did it willingly. They served with honor. They served with commitment. But they don't want a lot of attention drawn to it. They're just happy that they were able to serve, happy to do their part. And that's part of what makes our country so great. So uh, we're going to go through these, these slides, think about the things that they went through, um, the things they endured, and the service they gave to our country so that we can be a free country, that we can worship God in the way that we desire. Uh, that's one of the reasons our country was founded, and that's one of the reasons it's so important to keep it that way. So as we go through here, there are, uh, we try to make some association with people here in the church so that you might know how they're related, but we may not have gotten all the, the relatives in here. We didn't even attempt that. So if you uh, sit back and we'll have, there will be a few that uh, Robin and Irene and Tim are going to share about just to make things a little more personal to know what they, go, they went through. Okay. The first one is Private David Warwick Rhodes, who is the great-great-grandfather of Robin Spice. So this is David Warwick Rhodes, and as we were singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, I just had goosebumps on my arms because he was there at the time when that song was reflected upon. So he is my great-great-grandfather. David Wyrick Rhodes was born March 18, 1841, in Cass County, Indiana. His father's name was Thomas Jefferson Rhodes, and mother's name was Delilah Wyrick Rhodes. At the age of 20, when he, he was 20 when he enlisted into the Union Army. He was 5 feet, 6 inches tall, fair complexion with blue eyes and blonde hair. He was a private in the 29th Regiment under Captain Joseph P. Collins and Colonel Miller. He was wounded and taken prisoner at the Battle of Chickamauga in Georgia in September 1863. He was imprisoned at Anderville, Andersonville Prison in Georgia. Like so many other soldiers there, he did not receive adequate medical attention and was left to die. One day he was carried out for mass bur burial on the dead wagon, but some of the other members of the 29th Regiment knew he was still alive and rescued him off the death wagon and managed to escape from Andersonville Prison. Then they headed towards South Carolina where he then was able to go to the hospital and he went back to serving his country, well, the Union, again for another two years. And then he was discharged from the Army on April 11, 1865 in Indianapolis and later that same year, after he got home, he married Sarah Wharton of Washbush County, Indiana. David took his new bride and went to Iowa to claim his bounty. Their farm was in Abenos County near Drakeville, Union Township. Five of their six children were born there. In 1870, Sarah's parents were also living with them. Mr. Wharton gave his occupation as Minister of the Gospel. In April 1873, all of them moved to a farm in Sumner County, Kansas, near Rome. Their youngest son, Joe, was born there in 1883. Because of the parents' failing health, oh, excuse me, Sven, ah, but during the summer of 1900, David and Sarah went to Fairhope, Alabama to visit their son, Henry, and his wife, Mary, and their new baby boy, Alan. Because of the parents' failing health, Henry and Mary moved back to Kansas in 1904 to help on the farm. In 1906, they sold the farm and moved to Tillman County, Oklahoma, first to a farm near Greenfield, and four years later, in 1910, to a farm near Frederick, Oklahoma. Sarah died of a stroke on December 21, 1912. She had gone to Thorpe Springs to visit relatives. Her body was returned by train to Frederick for her funeral. She is buried in the Frederick Memorial Cemetery, two miles west of Frederick, Oklahoma. In 1913, David returned to Indiana for a family reunion. There were 113 present. He continued to live with his son, Henry, and the family. Because of his experiences during the Civil War, he was plagued by nightmares all his life, which was most likely to PTSD from his experiences. He also, in his final years, was, were marked by second childhood, which I imagine was kind of like dementia. Most family and friends remember him lovingly and kindly. David died at home in 1927 at the age of 89. He is also buried in Frederick, Oklahoma. 
next to his wife, Sarah. Leon Faus, uh, U.S. Army, World War I, and the father of Irene Jensen. World War I, 1918, the war to end all wars. Ha ha. Camp Funston, Spanish flu. Dad was 20 year, 21 year old farm boy, west, lived west of industry, Clay County side of Clay Dick, Dickinson County line. He registered June 5th, 1918, classified 1A. Inducted September 4th, 1918, stationed at Camp Funston, not very far from home, now Fort Riley. Corporal, 1st Company, 164th Depot. He loved horses, but his uh, discharge says he was not mounted. I'm sure that broke his heart, but I'm sure he had something to do with cavalry. The Spanish flu came to Camp Funston on March. 1918. He went in in September, so he definitely was in the Spanish flu. I don't know if he had it, but my World War II Navy veteran brother says he did. He's 10 years older than I, so he probably knew more than I do. He apparently survived because I'm here. <laughs> the armistice was signed November 11, 1918. He was discharged April the 3rd, 1919. He wasn't in long, and he didn't serve very hard, apparently, but I'm thankful for his part in defending our freedom. Private David Stitt, U.S. Army, World War I, 353 3rd uh, Infantry, Purple Heart for Mustard Gas, Jeannie Stitt's father-in-law. Fred Yarrow, U.S. Army, World War I, fa father of Delmer Yarrow, grandfather of Lee Yarrow. Albert Pomeranz, U.S. Army Infantry, World War I, 1918 through 1919, stepfather of John and Fred Jones. Uh, Technical Sergeant Walter Reed, U.S. Army Air Corps, 8th Air Force. Jerry asked me to tell you a little about, bit about Walter. Hard to do when I've never met the man. He died 12 years before I was ever born. I remember the first time I ever became aware of him. My grandparents had bought a block in Broken Bow, and each section of the block was given to their kids to raise their family on. And so we would all cross the alleys whenever Grandma was baking bread or but we were just needing to get out of the house because we were in trouble. And we would go over there, and in the living room was a picture of him sitting above my grandpa's recliner. And it took us a while before we asked who he was. And he was always sort of regarded as a hero. And it took us a while to understand what he was all about. They uh, started doing a little research on him and found his graduating class photograph from Broken Bow. Graduated in 1942. And under his FFA mention, it said, he was a chicken farmer at heart. And I think, yeah, you know, even into the 60s, on that block, there was chickens. 20 years later, Grandma was still raising chickens. When he left for war, those chickens was left in her care. Grandpa was crippled. Walked around on crutches, his legs were crossed, he couldn't work. So basically what they lived off of was her sewing, her gardening, and the chickens. And they lived 
and supported their family because of him and because of him. When he went to war, he was a technical sergeant, which meant he was in charge of being the ball turret gunner on a B-17. He was also in charge of fixing any repairs while in flight. So when the bombs failed to dislodge over Germany, that was his job to go out and stand over the open bomb bay door and jump on that bomb and hopefully not fall out. But he did it. His other job was to fly the plane if anything happened to the pilot or co-pilot. And each night, each day, he would sit there and write letters to him. His crew called him the quiet one. He didn't say a lot. He didn't go out on leave with them. And his paychecks were all sent back home. He didn't need much money if he was staying in the, in the barracks. But he support, supported the family. November 29, 1943, they went on a flight. He actually had one more flight than the rest of the crew because technical sergeants were hard to come by. And so he volunteered to take that extra flight. The November 29th was the fifth flight for his group. They flew in the uh, the plane called the Rickety Tavy. And they were the second group out of the 96th Bomber Group, 339th Squadron, over Bremen, Germany. They were hitting the ball bearing plants there. And on the return home, they were shot down. And he died that day. One thing Walter would tell you is sometimes the easy way out is to die in battle. They released a book about him and his crew this year, April, in April. The story is not about the guy that sends his paycheck home, that stayed in the barracks. Out of the group of ten, there was only two that lived. The navigator, he was blown out of the airplane. He had a parachute on. The tail gunner went back to get his parachute on, found it full of holes and unusable. And the Major Schmidt shot off that tail. So he rode that tail to the ground. Four and a half miles he fell. Four and a half miles he lived. He landed on the grain, ground, unsure if he was alive or dead. Captured by the Germans, they were both captured by Germans. He suffered through having his brain surgery performed in a prisoner of war camp, stuffed back in in 1943. He spent his time in some stalags. He spent weeks on what they call a hell ship, which is where they were. The Russians were advancing closer to Germany, so they loaded up all the prisoners, stuffed them in the hull of a ship where all you could do is stand. There was no sitting. And they were out there for weeks. So you urinated, you did everything, you slept while you stood. And they brought him back closer to Germany and then forced him on a 600-mile death march. Walter would tell you he took the easy way out. There are men and women that have served in the services that carry some of those same memories. They've seen the good side, and they have seen the bad side of man. And many of them are here today with us. They don't want to talk about it. They didn't, the guy didn't want to talk about his fall. They had to force it from him. 
but it's important to realize how much freedom is worth, how much it means to us. You know, I would salute them, but I've never been in the military. I don't know how to salute properly. And so really the only thing I can do is tell you, servicemen and women, those that serve on the police force and fire departments, thank you for your service. It's because of you that we enjoy this freedom. And there's only one other that has given up his life for us, died, but he's gone the extra step. Not only took all our sins and stuff on him, but he continues to live today for us. And that's what's important. We have freedom that we hardly touch, but was given so freely. And that's what I want you to know about Walter in Christ. Delmer Yarrow. Well, remember Del Delmer. U.S. Army, World War II, husband of Sharon and Marlee, and father of Lee. Lauren E. Decker, World War II, Army Air Corps, Japanese POW, uncle of Joyce Call. James C. Moon, U.S. Navy, World War II, 1941-1946, U.S. aircraft carrier USS Shenango, Jeannie Stitt's brother. Clarence James Bud Woodham, World War II, 1943-1945, served in the South Pacific and the New Hebrides Islands as a mechanic, and he was the first husband of Letha Lloyd. Earl Faust. World War II radio man, U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, brother of Irene Jensen. Sergeant Charles A. James, 8th Army Air Corps, 1941 through 1946, compass mechanic on the P-51 Mustang fighter, photo taken 1945 in Munich at Airfield R-85, father of Nancy Vesta. K.L. Reeves, U.S. Navy signalman on attack personal landing craft, he was at the invasion of Iwo Jima and Okinawa, father of Richard Reeves. Sergeant Frank R. Mayo, U.S. Army, Korea, 1951-1953, combat engineer, husband of Dorothy, father of Jerry, Tim, and Jeff. Warren Anderson, uh, Shore Patrol 3, Korean Army, 1953-1955, U.S. Army, husband of Barbara Anderson. PFC William E. Lewis, U.S. Marine Corps, father of Debbie Reeves, husband of Evelyn. Ernest Field, U.S. Army, World War II, who's a member of the Lawrenson family. Lauren Craig, AM3, U.S. Navy Flight Crew, Korean War, 1955 through 1959. Roger Stipp, U.S. Navy Diesel Engineerman, U.S. Class, First Class, USS Rehoboth, 1951-1954, the husband of Jean Stitt. Corporal Leroy Bartley, U.S. Army, Korean War, 1951 through 1953, husband of Betty, father of Bob, Elgina, and Rex. Fred M. G Fred M. Jensen, U.S. Air Force, husband of Sa Sally, father of Brenda and Diane and Jimmy. Aaron Hughes, Japan, South Korea, 1970 through 1992, who's a member of the Lawrenson family. Sergeant Arlen Hoblitzel, National Guard, 1941, 1949 through 1958, husband of Arlene Hoblitzel. Robert E. Bowlers from St. Joseph, Missouri, U.S. Navy, 1956, Seaman Apprentice, U.S. Naval Reserve, father of Kimberly Mayo. Danny Wynn, BT Second Class, U.S. Navy, 1966 through 1970, the USS Simon Lake, husband of Vicki, father of Jamie, Jared, and Jeff. Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Dennis L. Story, U.S. Air Force, 1964 through 1985, brother of Cindy Mayo. And Robert Henry Hank Adams, U.S. Army, 1958, husband of Darlene, father of Leanne, Lonnie, and Tyler. 
Michael Paul Meade, U.S. Army, son-in-law of Bill and Robin Spice. Staff Sergeant Harold Hank Stellner, U.S. Army, 1990 through 2010, husband of Melissa Stellner, son-in-law of Jerry and Cindy Mayo. Staff Sergeant Dustin Lesperance, U.S. Air Force, July 2009, grandson of Fred and Sally Jensen, son of Sandra Lesperance. Sergeant John Seamers, National Guard, 1984 through 1997, husband of Brenda Seamers, son-in-law of Fred and Sally Jensen. Staff Sergeant James Story, U.S. Marine Corps, 1948 through 1954, father of Cindy Mayo. Sergeant Jeffrey T. Cadwallader, U.S. Marine Corps, 1990 through 1995, husband of Heather Cadwallader, son-in-law of Jerry and Cindy Mayo. Brad Parsons, U.S. Marine Corps, Lee Campbell's nephew. Don Parsons, U.S. Army, Lee Campbell's brother. Don Parsons, Aaron Blair, U.S. Marine Corps, Richard Parsons, U.S. Army, Lauren Parsons, U.S. Navy, brother and nephews of Lee Campbell. Daniel A. Crummy, U.S. Navy police officer during the Vietnam era, brother of Joyce Call. Daniel E. Crummy, World War II, U.S. Army, father of Joyce Call. Sergeant Gary Franson, Army National Guard, deceased husband of Lee Campbell. Jim Parsons, U.S. Army, Lee Campbell's brother. Merlin Parsons, U.S. Army, Lee Campbell's brother. Everett Goodman, U.S. Navy, relative of the Meadows. Henry Goodman, U.S. Air Force, also a relative of the Meadows. Henry Goodman, U.S. Army, relative of the Meadows. Neil Linder, U.S. Coast Guard, relative of the Meadows. PFC Dom Carcelano, U.S. Army, husband of Maddie Coleman Carcelano, son-in-law of Pastor Matthew and Daniel Coleman. James Luck, Lux, childhood friend of Joyce Cole. Private Zach Stilson, who served in Denver Storm, friend of the calls. And we, as we pause this day, we honor our veterans. We thank you for your sacrifice and your service to us and our country. You are the backbone which keeps our country free and maintains the freedoms we enjoy today. We appreciate you and your service. We ask that God may bless you always. All gave some. Some gave. I like, would like to pray. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we come on this day. It's a solemn occasion as we remember our veterans, but it's a joyous day too that you've placed people like that in our midst who are, are willing to serve our country, who are willing to fight to protect the freedoms that you've given to us. We thank you for blessing us with these people. We thank you for, for them as we honor them and we salute them this day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now if you'd stand as you're able, we'll sing hymn number 791.
that enjoy some special music from John and Joyce. we get ready to sing this prayer that we're in a nation where we've sung two songs this morning that in, in our Pledge of Allegiance when we actually trying to change the Pledge of Allegiance um, and we've got a lot of division in the country but you know when it really comes down to it it's just about a growing <laughs> hatred towards our Lord and Savior and so we're in a time and we not only need to pray for our nation on a regular basis, but we need to pray for revival. And we need to really pray for our brothers and sisters that don't know Jesus Christ. So anyway.
let's just all sing God Bless America as a prayer. God bless America. I've only sat here and listened and taken part in communion for 40 years. This morning's different if I'm leading it. Today really touched my heart. Um, I remember my dad and all of his army buddies coming whenever they came through or if we went somewhere that we would go stop by and see them. And their camaraderie or friendship, how much that's touched their lives. Later in life, I got to meet a guy by the name of Russell, who meant a great deal to me. Dad was in the Army. Russell was in the Navy. You said how they lived with things and saw things that they never, they talked about the good and their brothers in arms, but not about some of the bad. As far as I know, my dad never won any medals. I really don't know. That really wasn't what was important to him. Russell, you could tell both of them were very proud of their military service. Russell died. I was asked to speak at his funeral, which and a lot to me. As they went through his things in a box in his shop, they found a silver star. Um, I looked it up. A silver star is the third highest award that someone could receive. Russell never said a word not only to me, but to his family, about being the recipient of the Silver Star. They had 
absolutely no idea. If you look up what that's for, I presume, knowing Russell, for him to win that, someone else paid the ultimate price. We should be very thankful for all the people who have paid the price for our freedom because it is definitely not free. So as we take part in communion today, let's have a special place in our heart for every person who served from the bottom to the top. It's something they do, and they do it to serve. Let's bow for prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this time to come together. We thank you for the specialness of this service, that it helps to remind each and every one of us how others have died for our freedoms, how Jesus was put upon the cross for us and for our sins. Lord, as we go forward this week and in the future, may we share that message with others that they might find salvation. Dear God, give us this, these blessings each and every day in remembrance of you. First we take the bread.
Take, eat, this do in remembrance for me. My body, his body was broken for us. In the same manner, they took the cup. <clears throat> This is a new covenant in my brother, blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all stand as we sing our closing hymn. Oh. 
pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning, and we thank you for those, those men and women who have served our country and served you. We thank you. We ask that you bless us and guide and direct us this week. For it's in Jesus' name.